My journey begins with a Cheon, my pastor, who is supposed to be speaking here, but I, I think I'm not supposed to say. <laughs> of a dream of a black man saying, come to Los Angeles, there's gonna be a great revival. From the beginning of this thing, I feel like my whole life has been joined to the black man and revival. We moved to LA and we pray and fast. They, they said the 80s were from Hades. We fasted and prayed and instead of revival, we got the riots in 92. We came here for that great revival and a man stands up in an emergency meeting, an African-American big black man pouring out his heart as the city's burning to the ground. Che is weeping because he had a dream in 1982 of a man, a black man saying to come to Los Angeles, there's gonna be a great revival. This man's weeping, pouring out his heart for the city. Che goes up to him and says, have you been praying for revival? The man says, I've been praying for revival since 1982. And under the rubble of the riots, I felt like I could hear the rumble of revival. I was watching the riots on television there in Pasadena weeping. And the Lord spoke to me and he says, and what's stunning is I feel like George Floyd was almost an exact replay of Rodney Howard, uh, Rod, Rodney King's beating. And the police were left off. Remember, they were acquitted. The, the riots broke out and the Lord spoke to me. 1992, what you're watching is revival in the negative. Because I could find a few prepared vessels in the midst of riots that can light up the city with Pentecostal fires. If I can find a people who are in one place and one accord. I actually have begun to wonder if riots and revival are actually rooted in our, in our history. You think about 1880, 1857, when the Supreme Court rules that Dred Scott is not a fully human being. The same year, the great prayer meeting revival breaks out and a million souls are saved. Riots and revival actually erupt together. 1997, 1998, I mean 1967, 68, you have the rising of the Black Panthers, the riots in Los Angeles, and at the same time, you're getting the charismatic movement and the Jesus movement rolling together. 1906, William Seymour, who experiences such great racism in his life, actually is led to Los Angeles and he gets above the noise of the, of, of the Jim Crow laws and he opens up heaven. 1906, four days later, three African-American men are lynched and the Atlanta riots break out. Could we be in a replay, brothers and sisters? To me, I have a feeling that the African-American William Seymour could be the healer of our nation. I'm really struck by this. We just had a dream given that I was raising up a hundred William Seymours. And they could see more because they lived above the noise and could see something that was coming from heaven. So I called my African-American friend in Los Angeles and I was burning with this word that I'd given years ago called TURN, the Upper Room Network, that the day would come when God would loose the Upper Room Network uh, and everywhere living rooms would be filled with people united together praying for one thing, a new Pentecostal fire. And I was thinking about this and I was reading a book by a man named Gaston Espinosa. And the book was all about William Seymour and how God had prepared that man through his experiences to be the man who could get above the noise and forgive and loose the tongue of fire that reverses our babble. 
I called the, my friend up, told him nothing. I said, what, what's on your heart? Oh, he said, Lou, you know what's on my heart? It's called the Upper Room Network. I'm raising up 120 living rooms in Los Angeles, bringing white and black together to pray for a new Pentecost. And he says, and I'm reading this book by a man named Gaston Espinosa, that William Seymour was the guy that was prepared. I got the book in my hand when he says it, and I felt like the Lord said, there's coming a revival. If we could get above the bitterness, if we get above the unforgiveness, that God may give us another opportunity to turn this thing around. I believe the African Americans are going to be used again to open up heaven over America. And we're going to pray that in a moment. I look at my journey. I was part of that journey in 1994. The outpouring of the Holy Spirit took place in Pasadena. I saw the connection between the riots and the revival and Cheon, an Asian man, was used to reconcile the races in Los Angeles because the race riots broke out between Asians and African Americans. God's not taken by surprise. I believe history is revisiting again. And I believe if we'll look for it, we could be at the beginnings of a fresh new Pentecost. And then on this journey, when I prayed, how can I turn America back to God? God sent me on the journey of the call and God kept my journey with the African-American. And what took place was an African-American man shared at the call. I don't re remember if you saw it. Remember at the call DC with 400,000, it's riveting how his mom had spared him. This man has become a mighty voice for the ending of abortion. I've wrestled over this so much. How do, how do we walk out the tension between the issue of racial reconciliation and the issue of, of holding fast, thou shalt not murder? It was in 2003, I came home reading a book on William Wilberforce, maybe I could find it, maybe I can't. <laughs> and I read a quote in William Wilberforce's book and I began to weep so intensely and the Lord said, you're gonna raise up a prayer movement for the ending of abortion in America. I knew it was connected to William Wilberforce. I came home and Cindy Jacobs, she's always messing with me. She says, Lou, if you don't lead those kids to the Supreme Court that you've been mobilizing, God will remove you and put someone else in your place. <laughs> I said, Cindy, I got to get that from God. And I did. <laughs> it's amazing that movie came out some years later, Amazing Grace. It's amazing how God sends you on storylines. Maybe you heard the story, but Amazing Grace, I was watching the movie. I got in there late to the movie. My daughter and my wife's the top rows, that, and I, I was down on the bottom row like this, watching the movie. And at the end of the movie, I'm so moved by William Wilberforce and his story, and the bagpipes are playing, and the credits are rolling, and the Holy Spirit whispers in my ear and says, Lou, you preached in a movie theater when you were a young man. Can you still preach in movie theaters? I said, oh, please. <laughs> but as the people stand, I turn around and I have a captive audience and I say, let's pray. Everyone stops. And I pray, Lord, raise up a William Wilberforce in America who will end the slave trade of abortion in America, in Jesus' name. I stagger out the building. A lady walks up to me. I don't know who she is. And she says, you know, at the end of that movie, I was thinking if that guy Lou Engle were here, he'd stand up and start preaching. And then you did. Three years ago, I tell the story because it's a cool story. It makes everybody happy. 
The Lord rebuked me. He says, you prayed a prayer, but you didn't believe it. You just tell the story because it's a good story. I raised up a man named President Trump to be that Wilberforce. Now, this is my tension. The, the, I don't even know how to, how to go there. But it is stunning to me that it started with an African-American movement, Azusa Street, for revival. And then God leads me to hold 50 days and 50 nights of intercession for the ending of abortion, praying for a pro-life president in an African-American church in Colorado Springs. It just keeps going on. I'm putting the puzzle together. I wonder if God is shouting something for 50 days and 50 nights we pray and God leads us to Washington, D.C. We had this life tape on because of a dream. And many of you know the story. One of our guys said if we would turn that life tape into life bands like the Livestrong bands, we could start a Martin Luther King movement like they did in Birmingham to end abortion. I said, that's so cool. A million people praying five times a day would be five million prayers a day pleading the blood of Jesus over the blood of 61 million babies. But I said, we don't need a good idea. We need a God idea. The next day, we're in front of the Supreme Court and an African-American young man walks by and says, hey, you guys, if you would turn that life, ba ba life tape in the life bands, like the Livestrong bands, I'd go back to my hometown, Birmingham, and start a Martin Luther King movement to end abortion. I've been looking at that, and I've been asking the question, why was it a black man? I have a feeling. But we're going to find reconciliation with one another. I have a feeling if we'll empty the baggage of our bitterness. The Lord led us in 2003 with a dream. And in this dream, we saw warring drums in the heavens. And it was Native American drums. And they were pounding in the heavens. And the voice said, this is God's war on abortion. Native Americans must lead it. African Americans must lead it. Every tribe must lead it. I think I haven't gotten it. I think the Lord was saying, I'm making war on abortion. And the African Americans and the natives and the, and the Latinos are going to tear this thing down. In the dream, we were with American Indian chiefs. And we saw the special fruit of the womb in the dream. And he says, you cannot buy this fruit unless you walk in the sandals of the Native Americans. In other words, you can't deal with abortion unless you feel the pain of the Native American and the African American. If you walk in their shoes, I wonder what George Floyd and what happened here it was like a Selma to get to church to begin to feel once again the pain of the African American, to begin to feel and walk in their shoes. So we begin to relook at ourselves and racism and the likes. But I'm wondering if we will do that, maybe it will be the African Americans who will rise up and throw this thing down.